Welcome to a production of the Sweetwater County Historical Museum. Today we will be discussing Western Expansion and the period between about 1804 and 1900. The Sweetwater County Historical Museum would like to acknowledge that the land it now occupies and the land it interprets are the ancestral lands of the Shoshone, Ute, and Bannock tribes. The museum would like to take this time to acknowledge the historic ownership of the land and the stewardship provided by the tribes to this land. In the early 1800s, the land owned by the United States was much smaller than the 50-state nation we see in the early 21st century. It expanded greatly with the Louisiana Purchase. There were many rumors about the resources of this land that was not well known to the residents of the new nation. Stories and trade items from many Native American tribes in the region added mystery and speculation to the land. President Thomas Jefferson sent an expedition, now known as the Corps of Discovery, led by William Clark and Meriwether Lewis, to explore the land and find a water route to the Pacific. They did not succeed in finding such a route, but they found many animal species not written about before and began mapping a region that was mostly unknown to Western explorers. Only one man died on their journey, most likely of appendicitis. Even the young wife of their French cook, Sacagawea, and her baby made the journey. The Corps of Discovery started a period of intense expansion of the United States and was one of the first steps in an ideology known as Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was the idea that the United States was chosen by divine providence, basically God's will and fate, to claim the land from one sea to the other. Not everyone agreed with this idea. Many opponents felt that it was the duty of the U.S. to claim the land through conversion to what they viewed as a more enlightened view instead of by conquering and force. What do you see when you look at this image? What do you think it represents? This painting by John Gast is called American Progress and is a common representation of Manifest Destiny. Columbia, depicted as an angel, physically spreads her enlightenment across the savage and physically dark landscape, as animals and Native Americans literally flee before her as she drapes telegraph lines across the landscape. The land of the United States further expanded with the annexation of part of Mexico, creating what is now the United States and Oregon. The land that now makes up Sweetwater County in southwest Wyoming includes portions that were once Mexican territory, seen here with the Blue Arrow. Both Green River and Rock Springs would have been part of Alta California. With all this new land, the U.S. government felt it needed to bring people to populate the land now owned by the government. There was also a deeply held scientific idea at the time that the rain follows the plow, that the Great American Desert, the typical description of the lands west of the Missouri River, was only that way because Native Americans weren't properly farming it. A way to solve both issues, they thought, was the Homestead Act of 1862. Passed during the Civil War, this act allowed men over 21, or those who could prove they were the head of household, the ability to gain land especially for free, with only a small filing fee. There were rules, however, such as living on the land for five years. If they lived there for only about six months, they could get the land for only a dollar an acre. The 160-acre plot of land, about the size of Walt Disneyland in California, was called a homestead. Other acts expanded the powers of the Homestead Act to include rules involving growing trees and expanding the maximum land if homesteaders combined various rules. Not everyone thought the Homestead Act was a great idea. Explorer John Wesley Powell, whose statue stands outside the Sweetwater County Historical Museum, was one of them. 
Powell is most well known for his expeditions down the Green and Colorado Rivers. Both of his two expeditions started in Green River, Wyoming. He was, however, also one of the first scientists to notice the difference in water needs between the eastern and western halves of the United States. He felt that acts like the Homestead Act ignored the realities of the water rights in the West. He was ignored at the time, but was ultimately proven generally correct. The effects of the Homestead Act bringing in untrained farmers to such difficult country was one factor that would help contribute to the Dust Bowl in the early 20th century. Would-be homesteaders, however, flocked to the West, particularly to places like Oregon, to find a new way of life. Land ownership at the time was one of the major ways of measuring wealth and status. And the opportunity to own their own self-sustaining plot of land was attractive to many. The thousands of migrants ultimately resulted in what we would now refer to as the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail was not exactly a general single trail, but a series of similar paths that people took to get from Missouri to Oregon. South Pass and the Sweetwater River which ran through it made such journeys quite possible. Beginning mostly in the mid-19th century, over 500,000 people would pass through places like Sweetwater County to reach a new home in places like Oregon and California. Many mountain men shifted from traditional fur trapping to guiding these new migrants to their destinations, and many guidebooks were published to help guide travelers. This image was taken from the Emigrant's Guide to California and Oregon by L.W. Hastings, a copy of which is now hosted on archives.org. The discovery of gold in California in 1849 brought even more travelers called emigrants. Now known as the California Gold Rush, this event also gave us names like the famous sports team, the 49ers. Other gold rushes occurred in places like the Yukon and South Pass City, Wyoming. Other travelers had different motivations. The Church of the Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints, typically referred to as the Mormons, were forcibly pushed out of Nauvoo and traveled west to find a new location. Ultimately, the Mormons found a home in what they would call Zion, in modern-day Utah. Many more groups of Mormons would follow with their own guidebooks. The Mormon Trail, California Trail, and Oregon Trail were all very similar for most of the journey starting from Missouri until they reached the modern county line of Sweetwater County. There, parting of the ways would lead the Oregon Trail emigrants on the sublet cutoff, while other groups would continue. All of the journeys took between four and six months and required planning to make sure to avoid winter whenever possible. The consequences of improper planning could be quite catastrophic. One famous failed attempt to travel west was the Donner Party. The group made many mistakes, including leaving far too late and not being careful when packing. One wagon was dubbed the Prairie Palace and was reported to be three stories and included a library. One major mistake was following the advice of Hastings and taking a less common route to California across what is now Nevada. Hastings had only taken the journey once before on a supply trip. He was one of only two men to have crossed the Great Salt Lake Desert and neither brought wagons. The devastating journey would result in the loss of many of the Downer Party's wagons and livestock, and so deep divisions in the group. The party would ultimately become stuck in the Sierra Nevada mountains in a snowstorm for four months before a rescue party arrived. Several migrants eventually committed cannibalism in an attempt to stay alive. Less than 50 of the more than 70 travelers survived the ordeal. Places like Donner Pass and Donner Lake now bear the name of the ill-fated party. Approximately 20,000 people died on the immigrant trails, mostly due to diseases like cholera and dysentery. Though there were attacks from Native Americans and other groups, the fear of attack was often more common than actual events. One major factor in the movement of people to the frontier was the progress in methods of moving people goods, and information. Trains in the stagecoach could bring people, goods, and even the mail from across the country. The telegraph also allowed for
for increased amounts of information from across the country and the world, even to remote areas like the Dakotas, Wyoming, and Sweetwater County. Unlike in the East, where trains often connected existing cities, the frontier had few towns to connect. This meant many felt it was a bad idea to put money into building railroads into places where there weren't any people or goods. Eventually, the railroad solved the problem by creating the towns themselves. In places like South Dakota and Wyoming, many surviving towns owe their existence to the railroad. Some were literally created by the railroad, like Rock Springs, Wyoming, and Mitchell, South Dakota. Others, like Green River, Wyoming, merely thrived thanks to them. The Union Pacific Railroad built many mines in Rock Springs and Sweetwater County, Wyoming, mining coal for their fuel. They also brought a great number of miners in to mine the coal. The earliest miners were from the same places as the people who built the railroad, mostly the Irish, Cornish, Scottish, and Welsh. Over time, they started hiring more Chinese miners. At one point in the late 1800s, 60 to 80 percent of the population of Rock Springs, Wyoming, was Chinese. They were isolated, living mostly in a separate community known as Chinatown. The Chinese were not very well liked. Outside of the Lunar New Year, a popular event for many of for many ethnic backgrounds. Many white miners felt the Chinese, who would work for lower wages, were bringing down their wages too. The final straw was when the Chinese miners refused to join a miners union, fearing that striking would result in them not getting paid. One night on September 2nd, 1885, two white miners and two Chinese miners got into a fight in the mine. The noise got the attention of the whole mine until the Chinese were all rushed out. After a meeting at the bar, the white miners decided that the Chinese needed to be dealt with and chased the Chinese out of Rock Springs by force, killing dozens and injuring dozens more. They then burnt more than 40 buildings, often taking what they could and destroying everything else. The Chinese returned and rebuilt with the help of the U.S. Army. Rock Springs was the only occupied city outside of the Civil War South for more than a decade. Today, the event is known as the Rock Springs Massacre. Similar massacres involving the Chinese happened in places like California, and a famous class riot involving coal miners took place in Colorado, known as the Little Law Massacre. As the West opened up, and more and more people came, conflicts between groups only increased. Cattle ranchers often needed to move their cattle on large drives back and forth across the West. As more and more settlers came, the large lands needed for cattle ranching began being fenced off and broken up. The cattle ranchers often felt that they were there first, while the homesteaders felt they owned the land legally. Homesteaders often banded together, vowing to protect the land of themselves and their neighbors, by force if necessary. This often led to armed conflicts when the ranchers and cowboys were also armed. These armed conflicts became known as range wars. One of the most well-known is Wyoming's Johnson County War. Eventually, the West was slowly fenced off, and large cattle drives became mostly a thing of the past. But ranching continued. In southwest Wyoming, sheep herding became much more profitable and required less arable land than cattle ranching. By 1900, there were more than 5 million sheep in Sweetwater County. One of the more famous depictions of Western expansion period is the famous images of the Wild West. Cowboys and desperados wielding six-shooters and taming the West one bullet at a time. Cowboys definitely existed, and continue to exist in some form. However, depictions in movies with many actors like John Wayne tend to send an inaccurate picture. A large portion of cowboys were not white, many being Mexican and even some African Americans and ex-slaves. Nate Love, also known as Deadwood Dick of Colorado, and Isom Dart of the Browns Park area near Sweetwater County were both famous ex-slave cowboys. Robert Leroy Parker, better known as Butch Cassidy, was a famous train robber and outlaw. His sister said he earned the alias Butch 
while he was working in a butcher shop in Rock Springs, Wyoming. A famous fictional movie is based on his life. Cornelius Donahue, better known as Lamb Johnny, was a well-educated horse thief, nicknamed for an injury he earned in his youth. Lamb Johnny was eventually lynched after being the mastermind behind a large gold heist. The stagecoach taking him to face his crimes was stopped, and the guards had mysteriously vanished, leaving only the sheriff surrounded by masked vigilantes. The vigilantes forced the sheriff to drop his gun, and by the time the sheriff had gotten his gun, Lame Johnny had been hung in a nearby tree. The creek in South Dakota near where the event took place is still known as Lame Johnny Creek. The shackles he wore were removed from his body and are now on display at the South Dakota State Historical Society Museum in Pierre, South Dakota. As more and more settlers came into the West, they tended to view the frontier as an empty and barren wildland waiting to be tamed. The people already living there were viewed either as enemies in a war or savages needing to be brought into modern society. Many of these cultures did not have a Western view of land ownership or even a similar form of government. Many tribes operated more as individual bands, more than unified tribes. Agreements, called treaties, were often later shown to be forced on people who didn't really know or understand what they were agreeing to. In many cases, the U.S. Supreme Court has confirmed that the United States reneged on its treaty agreements with tribes. For example, in U.S. v. The Sioux, a 1980 court case, the Supreme Court determined that the United States illegally transgressed by claiming a large area of land in western South Dakota. During the 1800s, Native American families were often separated to send children to schools where they would be taught to be more American, including the Carlisle Indian School. Their native language was often banned, and they were not taught their ethnic culture. A common phrase at the time was the goal of kill the Indian to save the man. While some Native Americans, including tribes like the Eastern Shoshone, sided with the American government, the conflicts between cultures were not always peaceful either. There were many conflicts between Native American tribes and the U.S. government, including the Lakota, the Crow, and the Arapaho. Sometimes there were active battles with combatants on both sides, such as the Battle of the Little Bighorn, where George Armstrong Custer was famously defeated and killed, along with many of his men. While other conflicts were more one-sided. Were more one-sided, such as the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890, when nearly 300 Lakota, mostly women and children, were killed in South Dakota. To many Native Americans, the settlers were invaders, colonial individuals who didn't belong, claiming land that wasn't theirs, and many of them had different ideas over if the land could even be owned. Often, conflicts started with issues such as treaties not being honored, resulting in starvation and desperation. Some Native American leaders, like Chief Washakie of the Eastern Shoshone, sided with the U.S., seeing that as the best future for their people. Others, such as Sitting Bull of the Hunkpapa Lakota, thought that the best option was to fight to protect their way of life and their people. Chief Washakie became the only Native American to have a U.S. fort named after him and was buried with military honors. Sitting Bull eventually brought his people back to a U.S. reservation and was ultimately killed during an attempted arrest. The primary solution to the problems as many American settlers and the U.S. government saw it was to ensure Native Americans were more Americanized. At first, the Native American tribes were treated as separate nations and granted special areas of land called reservations. These lands held a portion of land in trust by the U.S. government for the governments of the tribes. The laws are kind of complicated, but generally this means that the U.S. government is holding a property, in this case the land, on behalf of a separate government, like a parent might hold a trust of money for a child. This reservation system was broken up by the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act was meant to, at least on paper, treat Native American tribes more fairly and help bring them into a more Western society. The Dawes Act gave each Native American head of household a homestead from the area of the reservation and required certain behavior and rules. 
This, however, also meant that Native Americans lost the rights to make treaties and to vote to help to decide their own fates. The remaining land was sold off, often to white settlers. The act was eventually repealed and the reservations restored, but many reservations still have strange checkerboards of owned homesteads purchases during the Dawes Act. Today, the reservations have their own governments and their own laws, and their citizens are dual citizens of both the United States and of their own tribal nation. The Wind River Reservation in northern Wyoming is the home of both the Eastern Shoshone and the Arapaho tribes. For all of these reasons and more, people traveled west in the 19th century. By the beginning of the, of the 20th century, many historians have agreed that there was no longer a frontier in the western U.S., nor did these events occur in a vacuum. The Homestead Act was passed during the Civil War. Butch Cassidy and other outlaws were warming the West while upper-class Victorian socialites attended parties in other parts of the United States. Has Western expansion had an impact on your life today? Do you think it's an important thing for people in Wyoming or even other parts of this country to learn about this period of history? What do you think? Thank you for watching. As always, make sure to keep on learning and check out some of our other great videos on our YouTube channel as well. We'd love to hear from you.